Welcome to Passion for Sound, the channel dedicated to thorough and honest reviews of headphones, earphones, DACs, headphone amps, other components and accessories. Basically everything audio related except power amps and passive speakers. My name's Lachlan and my goal is to explore and discuss all kinds of audio topics, even the controversial ones, to help us all find more enjoyment from music. Thanks for watching and enjoy the video. Hey folks, welcome to another Passion for Sound audio review. And today another battle, this time with IEMs instead of headphones. Last time I ran the headphone battle as a king of the cans, so this time it's the $200 IEM Hero. And that's going to include a comparison of the Triforce i3 Pro IEM, the Moondrop Carto, and a relatively unknown IEM called the Ambient Dynamics AD006 or Lindale. Before I get into telling you about all those IEMs, how they're priced, how they're designed, all that sort of thing, I just want to mention an amazing opportunity that's come forward. Following my King of the Cans battle with budget planar magnetic headphones, Igor from Virum has come forward and offered a pair of Virum Ones to a viewer of the channel as a giveaway prize. So this is a fantastic opportunity to get your hands on a wonderful, wonderful pair of planar magnetic headphones at no cost to you. All you need to do is watch the rest of this video, watch out for the question that I put on screen and provide your answer to that question down below. The winner will then be drawn at random after a couple of weeks to give plenty of people a chance to watch this video and get into the draw and the winner will receive themselves a pair of Virum ones sent directly to you from Eagle. So they're going to be a brand new freshly made pair of Virum ones. So make sure you watch the rest of this review, watch for the question, put your answer down below and of course make sure you're subscribed so you see my announcement when it comes through. I want to say a huge thanks to Igor from Virum for making this possible and good luck to all of you that enter. For now though, let's get into finding and crowning the $200 IEM Hero. For those of you that may not have seen my budget planar magnetic king of the cans battle, the way this works is I'm going to provide a brief review of the fit, features, comfort, design, all those bits and pieces for each of these IEMs, and then I'm going to pit them against each other to work out which one I think is the best of the bunch. So they all sit at around about the 200 US dollar mark, but there is some variation. And as always, there is no guarantee that the most expensive headphone will win. Something else I should mention here is that my review and battle of these type of products doesn't come down to any sense of there being one right tuning. So as much as I tend to prefer a warmer tuning overall, if a brightly tuned earphone or headphone is overall better done, I am going to respect that and therefore put it above a warmer earphone that's maybe not quite as well executed. So do keep that in mind. This is not based entirely on my preferences, although of course preference will always come into it, but it's not just about which one hits my personal preferences for music listening the most. It's about which one I think is doing everything well to produce the most natural and realistic representation of the music that can be the most enjoyable. For now though, let's take a look at the entrance in the $200 IEM Hero Battle. I'd like to send my thanks to the providers of these IEMs, and that means saying thank you to Hi-Fi Go for the i3 Pro, and thank you as well to Shenzhen Audio for the Moondrop Carto. Ambient Dynamics themselves sent me the AD006 Lindales, and so of course thank you to them as well. I'll put links down below through to each of those retailers for the respective products. So if you like what I have to say about them, you can buy from them and say thank you. There's no affiliation attached to any of these. It's just a way of saying thanks. Starting with the cheapest by a very small margin, we've got the Tri i3 Pro that comes in at $189. We've then got the Moondrop Carto, which comes in at $190 US dollars. And then we finish off with the Ambient Dynamics Lindale or AD006. I'm going to call it a Lindale throughout the rest of this video. The Lindale comes in at a list price of $249 US dollars, but it's currently on 
sort of an early bird release type process where it keeps being listed at 199. So all three of these sit at or just below 200 US dollars in terms of the pricing you're likely to actually get them for. And having recently reviewed and loved the Eco OH10, which also has a list price that sits at just under 200 at 199 US dollars, it made sense for me that after working out which three of these I think is the best, I'm then going to put that winner up against the OH10 to see which one comes out on top as for me, the ultimate $200 IEM hero. Now, of course, there are other IEMs in the same ballpark that I haven't considered here. I recognize that there will be other options that could be as good or better than some of these, but I can only work with what I have. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the cheapest option of the bunch in the Tri i3 Pro. These are a tribrid IEM, but in this case is a dynamic driver doing the base, a balanced armature doing the mids, and as far as I'm aware, the planar magnetic driver being used is actually for the highs. Often we think of planar magnetics as being a base related driver, but here that's been flipped and it's being used as I understand it for the treble. Now it's worth mentioning for those of you that haven't heard of Tri before, as I understand it, they're like an extension of KB ear. So they're kind of like the Lexus to Toyota. Tri is the Lexus, whereas KB ear is the Toyota. So there's some heritage, some experience, and some brand stability behind the tries. And they also had the previous model, which was the regular i3, which I believe was quite well regarded. I haven't heard it myself, so I'm coming in fresh and clean with no previous experiences of the Tri brand. These are a 15 ohm, 103 decibel IEM, and like all of the IEMs in this comparison, they require nothing special to drive them in terms of power. All three of these will actually give you great benefits if you give them a quality source, because they're all very resolving in their own way, but at the same time, you don't need huge amounts of power. In the package of the i3 Pro, you get yourself this little leather pouch. I've seen this with other brands. It's a fairly generic pouch, but it's a good solid option. Within there, you get a copper cable, which unfortunately is only 5N copper. It's not a big deal, but knowing that many brands are coming out with 6N and purity is one of the biggest things that improves the quality of the sound coming through, it would have been nice to see a 6N cable, but at the same time, it's a lovely cable. It's thick, but it sits nicely. It uncoils well without holding onto too much shape. And then at the end of that, we've got two pin connectors into the IEMs themselves. The IEMs are a lovely aluminium shell, quite similar to the recently reviewed Yuan Li from T-Force. But on this occasion, inside each shell, as I've already said, are those three drivers, dynamic, balanced armature, and planar. One of the great things about the i3 Pro is their comfort. They fit and snug into the ear really, really beautifully. They're a wonderfully comfortable IEM, despite looking fairly bulky when you first get them. A part of that could be the fantastic range of tips provided. Try have given us a set of gray silicon tips, as well as some sort of translucent tips with different colored stems, depending on the size. And that means you can get a really nice fit by choosing the right size for your ears. The final thing you get, is a little microfiber polishing cloth, and you're going to need that because these things are fingerprint magnets. Being a polished metal shell, and I said before aluminium, I might be wrong on that one. They're metal. Which metal they are, I actually haven't confirmed, so don't hold me to the aluminium piece, but they're a polished solid metal shell, so that means they are going to show every single mark, fingerprint, etc. So you might be getting pretty heavy use out of the polishing cloth if that's something that concerns you. Putting aside all of the accessories and bits and pieces, let's now talk about the sound of the i3 Pro before we move on to start comparing it with the next option in the range. Now I should mention here that when I'm going through the different tracks that I've listened to, these are not the only tracks I've listened to for each of these IEMs. These are not the only tracks I've used to compare them. In many cases, I've listened to multiple tracks and flipped back and forth between the two. The ones that I share on the channel are just the ones that specifically stood out to me for whatever reason. And so we're going to start off talking about the Tri i3 Pro with the track Capable of Anything by Ben Folds. The first thing that stood out to me about the Tri i3 Pro was that it has excellent separation of sounds. Everything is really cleanly separated, really cleanly placed in the sound stage, and the sound stage has a really nice width. But it doesn't have a great deal of depth, so if you're a fan of big, deep sound stages, this is probably not going to be the best IM for you. I think a part of the accuracy in the 
image placement of the i3 Pro is that it's got quite enhanced treble. When you take a look at the frequency response graph for these, it's very flat all the way from one end to the other. There's lumps and bumps along the way, but the point is there's no kind of roll off in the treble. And what that means is that they can tend to overemphasize some treble, and therefore you get a slightly unnatural sound on things like hi-hats and cymbals. Some people are going to love it for the extra detail it brings. I personally found it a little bit distracting because it does make those sounds unnatural. It can also make vocals get a little bit over airy and a touch nasal at times, a touch thin. But something I was impressed with at the same time was that it controls sibilance really well. So on sounds like S, T, things like that, they don't ever tend to get harsh coming from the i3 Pro. As I listened to Capable of Anything, there were multiple instruments being used in that track that gave me a really interesting sense of just how the whole frequency response comes together on the i3 Pros. So with instruments like violins, you get a wonderful sense of attack and clarity from the strings, and you get that textural information. But at the other end of the orchestral scale, down with things like the cellos, those were just lacking a little bit of weight. As I'll talk about soon, the bass from these is really well extended, but it's just a bit light in comparison and balance with the rest of the frequency range, and it does bring these undone just a little bit when listening to wide ranges of music. Instruments like the flutes sound wonderful because there is that really balanced clarity and tonality from the mids all the way through the treble. So there's no holes or dips or peaks to really throw off the tonality of the flute, so they do come through really well. On the other hand, the piano is just a bit overemphasized in the treble, and it means there's too much of the percussive sound of the piano, so the hammer's hitting the strings, and not enough of the richness and resonance of the piano. As I've alluded to, the bass extends very, very well, so it's got all of the depth that you need, but it doesn't have quite the presence, the weight, or the authority when you need it. So the bass is always there, it's very well balanced, it's got a good sense of speed and a decent amount of punch, not exceptional but decent, but it doesn't really have any presence behind it. So what you'll find is things like kick drums don't really have any rumble, any presence to them where they probably should. And so overall what I found was that the i3 Pro is a very enjoyable earphone to listen to. It's got excellent balance from the very bottom through to the very top, probably overemphasizing the treble a little bit, but that does bring some extra detail and clarity, particularly with such well-controlled sibilance. And it's an IEM that I completely respect. It's not a tuning that I would personally enjoy, but it's doing that tuning very, very well. As I said before, the ability for it to create a wide soundstage with really good focus on positioning of details and instruments within that soundstage is excellent. And what we're starting to see with IEMs like this and some of the others in this review is that we're getting to a point where this $200 range of IEM can really compete with much higher levels of performance, at least what was higher level in the past. Now that's not to say that these are going to be competing with $500, $700, dollars IEMs. You can still get better performance. So if you see reviews out there saying you're getting flagship performance for $200, yes and no is my answer to that one you're getting excellent performance for what was once possible, but just as these have started to improve in performance, so have other IMs as well. So the whole scale is shifting. And what that means is these are absolutely excellent and for many people will be all they ever need. But it's not to say that you can buy these and think you're getting top of the range, 1000 plus US dollar performance because it's not entirely accurate. And so with that caveat out of the way, and a general description of the fact that the i3 Pros are an excellent IEM with a tuning that's not my preference, but a tuning done very, very well, let's now take a look at the Moondrop Kato. The Kato come in at just $1 more than the i3 Pro, but they're offering a very different setup. Unlike the tribrid approach of the i3 Pro, the Kato use a single dynamic driver. And that can be a fantastic thing because it often produces the most coherent sound when you're not trying to marry together multiple different driver types, crossovers, all those sorts of things. The dynamic driver brings with it 32 ohm impedance, which is relatively high for an IEM, but still no issues for any devices. And particularly when you pair that up with the sensitivity of 123 decibels. This might be one of the most sensitive IEMs I've ever tried. And that doesn't cause any problems because you've got good impedance to go with that high sensitivity. So it's not like one of those 6 ohm, 120 decibel sensitivity IEMs that's going to hiss with everything you plug it into. 
it's much more reasonable in that regard and gave me no issues with any source. If I grab the Cartos now, in the little case that they come with, which is essentially the same form factor as the i3 Pro, but just in a different color scheme. And I quite like it, it's a nice little case. It's no better than the Tri i3 Pro one, but it's nice. Opening it up, there's a few things worth talking about here. Let's start with the IEMs. These are heavy IEMs. They're probably on par with something like the OH-10, which I've talked about before, but they're also comfortable, just like the OH-10. So don't let the weight of these put you off. They sit really nicely. Once again, they're a solid metal body, and there's been a lot of care put into the tuning and the shaping of these, both from an aesthetic point of view, but also from a tuning of the acoustics on the inside point of view. While we're talking about the housings, there are two different nozzles available for the Cartos, and they come with both. So they come with a pair of steel nozzles and a pair of brass nozzles. Which one you prefer is probably going to be very personal. I actually myself like the brass nozzles and that's surprising because it goes completely against my normal preference for tuning. There's no extra damping or anything being added in the nozzles. It's purely the material itself. So the qualities and the properties and the metals that's doing the adjustment of the sound as I understand it. What I found as I tried both sets of nozzles was that whilst the steel nozzle brings a little bit more bass, it also brings a bit more treble. And what that produced for me was a sound that was just a little bit less smooth and a little bit less focused in the imaging. When I change over to the brass, it drops both the bass and the treble slightly, but the end result for me was a sound that seemed much more focused. I could hear individual instruments and sounds a bit better than I could with the steel. Both tips are great, I could happily listen to either, but the brass has definitely been my preference. I went hunting through the waterfall and distortion measurements of these to see if I could find a reason for why one tip was preferable over the other, but I couldn't see any significant differences, at least not with my basic setup here, and so I'm not going to try and guess at why one is better than the other. It could be just very simple adjustment in the frequency response is bringing forward certain qualities from the brass that are not as present in the silver or the steel. So I don't know what's causing it, but I definitely prefer the brass nozzles. A couple of other things to talk about before we get into the sound quality is that Moondrop have also released some brand new silicon tips with these. And it took me a while to get used to them. They're called the spring tips. And they're a silicon tip. They've got this interesting kind of design where unlike a spin fit where it's got a tilting motion of the actual tip where it attaches to the stem, these don't have that, but there's a bit of give in and out of the tip. So you've got your nozzle here, the tip's able to move a little bit in and out. They're quite a flexible, soft silicon on top. And what I found was that at first it feels like they haven't fitted in properly because they don't produce any pressure inside the ear the way they kind of adjust to fit just right in the ear canal. So it took me a while to get used to them. Once I did get used to them, I really, really like them. It's not to say that I wouldn't still play with tip rolling on these. I don't think the spring tips are necessarily the best tip ever, but they're a really, really nice tip. And it's nice to see manufacturers like Moondrop coming up with quality tips rather than some of the trash that we sometimes get. The final accessory dimension, which is also a strong point with the Cartos, is their cable. This is the stock cable. It's not the special cable that was part of the pre-order as I understand it. This is just the basic everyday stock cable that comes with the Cartos, and it's a beautiful silver plated copper cable. I'm not necessarily a fan of silver plated copper, but in terms of general cable quality, this one looks and feels great. It's a simple twisted cable, it sits nicely, it doesn't hold shape in particular, it's just a great cable to use. So again, I think it's wonderful that Moondrop are providing excellent accessories to go along with a flagship design like this. Before we talk about sound, and this probably goes without saying, but I'm going to mention it anyway, these being a metal housing, just like the i3 Pro, are fingerprint magnets. So do be aware of that. If that's an issue for you, you're going to need to think about whether you want the shiny metal polished finish of the Carto or the i3 Pro. Now, I think I might have seen that the Carto do come in a matte finish, so do check out. There might be other options available. I haven't looked into that in depth because I wanted to focus most of this review on the sound comparisons between these. And with that in mind, let's start talking about the sound of the Carto in comparison and relation to what I've told you about the i3 Pro. The track that I ended up landing on as my comparison point for these two was Sunday Morning by Maroon 5. And as I said before, I listened to lots of stuff. This is the track that I happen to choose to stop and make notes on. Listening to Sunday Morning on the Cartos, it's very, very difficult to find fault. Sound placement or imaging, if you like, is excellent across the board. Everything is just beautifully placed, beautifully focused. 
Now keep in mind, this is me listening with the brass tips. The steel tips for me weren't quite as strong in this area, but still very, very good. And others may actually find for them, the steel work even better. Base extension from the Cardos was also very, very good. And the weight in the base, the presence in the base was also quite solid. Neither of these are particularly punchy, thumpy earphones, but certainly I did find the Carto gave me a nice sense of punch from the kick bass at the beginning of this track. Whether it's as strong as I'd like it to be, that's another question, but within the tuning of the Carto, it was really nicely done. The piano and the guitar in the opening section of this song were really nicely rendered, very natural sounding, a great sense of detail. And then there was the keyboard that's kind of hovering off to the left. Everything was just really nicely put together by the Carto. As the vocals come in, everything is just natural, balanced, clean, detailed, well-focused. As I said at the beginning of this, there's really nothing I can complain about with the Carto. It does what it does beautifully. Once again, it's an IM that's not necessarily my preferred tuning. It's still a little bit lean in the bass for me, but I can't help admiring what it's doing, and I do think it's a fantastic IM, particularly for those of you that do like a slightly leaner tuning. Those of you that prefer something that's more focused on detail and mid-range, rather than necessarily balancing out the bass and the mids and the treble all as evenly as what I consider to be natural. And again, that's my perception of natural. It might be different for you, and that's completely fine. And so now having described the Carto on its own, let me give you a quick comparison with the i3 Pro, and let's work out which one continues on to contend for the title of $200 IM Hero. Off the bat, I wanna say that on this track, both of these IMs sounded great. This was quite a difficult one to call, but I did come out with a clear winner. One thing that surprised me was that on this track, the i3 Pro actually showed itself to have a really nice sub bass kind of rumble to it. Beneath all of that other information that's up in the treble area, there's this beautiful solid bass presence coming through. Now the Carto is still very good, but the i3 Pro did come across as better, and that quite surprised me. It had a really nice sense of rumble, as I said, underneath everything else. And it's going to depend very much on the track you're listening to and the mix of that track as to whether or not you get to hear that from the i3 Pro. But it was kind of cool to know that it's there. In the end, the way I had to separate these two really came down to the tonality. Which of these did I think had the most natural and realistic tonality of the two? And that's where, for me, the Carto did pull ahead. Part of the benefit of a more natural tonality is that it actually allows all of the details to come forward. With the i3 Pro, as much as it does it very, very well, it tends to focus most of your attention on the upper end of the register. And that's great if you want to focus on treble details, but if you want to hear all of the details from the bass right through to the treble, then you really need something that's a bit more naturally balanced. And that's where the Carto for me is stronger. I was hearing details and clarity from the Carto that I couldn't get from the i3 Pro. And what I mean by that is it was clarity and detail that stretched down into the mids, the upper bass, all of that was coming through well balanced, whereas it was a bit lost on the i3 Pro because of the amount of treble. And so for this battle, despite having two very strong IEMs with different but excellent tunings, the Carto does move on to see if it can be the $200 IEM hero. And the next contender that it has to face is the Ambient Dynamics Lindale. Now you might say, who's that? What's that? Where's that from? This is a new brand. Ambient Dynamics reached out to me to see if I'd like to review these. They happened to turn up at about the same time as everything else here. And I thought, what a great way to introduce you to an IEM that you might not otherwise consider. You might have sat there thinking, I know Moondrop, I've heard of the original i3, they're the two that I'm going to have in my shortlist. And so I wanted to deliberately include the Ambient Dynamics Lindale to see if it could stack up as a new player in the market. Just to remind you, the Lindale is also called the AD006. So its model number itself is AD006. Lindale's kind of, it seems like their nickname for it, but it's easier to say, so I'm going to call it the Lindale. These have a list price of $249 US dollars, but they're going through an early release cycle at the moment where they're coming out in waves at $199 per unit. So at that price, they're once again very comparable to the i3 Pro and the Carto. The Lindale bring a dynamic driver and balanced armature hybrid design, and they're a 12 ohm, 109 decibel sensitivity setup. So again, nothing crazy, nothing too difficult. I've had no problems with those either. One thing I do want to mention is that you do get a little bit of driver flex from the Lindales when you're putting them in your ears. And for those not familiar, what that's about is that when you're inserting dynamic driver earphones, depending on how effectively they've been vented, pressure buildup as you push the 
earphone into your ear canal can actually push back on the driver and cause the driver to be moved and flexed, which will create a sort of crinkling sound. Now it doesn't do any damage to the driver itself, but it's not the most pleasant sound, and I always find it a shame when an earphone does that. Not a reason not to buy it, but I do want to mention in case anyone is absolutely hellbent on not buying an IEM that has driver flex. Ambient Dynamics have done a few things differently from the others here in terms of their presentation of the earphones, and part of it starts with this case here. As you can see, it's a significantly larger case, and I really like it, but I also want to call out the fact that it may not be quite as practical. It's large, and therefore you couldn't chuck it in your pocket easily. It's more of a bag size case than a pocket size case. Whereas I could at a pinch put either of the other two into a jeans pocket. When we open the case up, on the inside you've got space up here for storing the cable. You've then got the IEM sitting in their own little protective spaces there. I'll come back to those in a second. And you've got your ear tips in the case with you. So on one hand, I really like that you've got everything you need in one case. You've got space for adapters, different cables. There's a lot going on here that's really positive, but it's not as practical space-wise. The other thing for me is that I don't find I generally need to carry around a bunch of tips with my IEMs. Maybe if you're a user of foam tips, that would be beneficial to have a few spares with you. But anyone who's using silicon tips, you'll generally find you find the pair that you like, you put them on, and that's it. So having all this extra space for this little case here does seem a bit extreme, but at the same time, it's not a reason not to buy them, I just wanted to talk it through. While we're talking about the tips here, this case comes with a series of silicon tips and foam tips, as well as a cleaning brush, and they're really nice quality. All three of these IEMs come with some of the best silicon tips I've seen as stock tips in packages. So we've got some really fantastic options here in terms of our tips. Something else that's quite different is the design of the IEMs themselves, which I can't pick up because they're slippery. These are an acrylic shell. They're designed in this pseudo custom style where everything's like a custom until you get to the tip or the nozzle, and that's where you can put on your silicon tips. So it's a very, very comfortable IEM, as are all of these really. The Cardo's probably the weakest of the lot, but it's still very, very good. So I wouldn't complain about comfort on any of these, and I absolutely wouldn't make a decision on any of these based on comfort. Certainly, I think if I had to rank them, the i3 Pro is probably the most comfortable, then the Lindale, then the Carto, but they're all roughly a 9 out of 10 for comfort for me. And so coming back to the Lindales, we've got these beautiful acrylic shells that look beautiful, they feel beautiful, and then the final piece of the puzzle, which is probably the weakest in this whole thing, is a fairly basic copper cable. It's a copper cable with a combination of black and clear insulation, so it looks quite nice, but it's very, very lightweight, and in my playing around with it, I don't think it's at quite the level of the others in this comparison, both in terms of the ergonomics, but also the quality doesn't feel quite as good. Just because it's a bit lighter and thinner, it just feels a bit flimsy to me. It's not a big deal once again, but it's not as strong as the other two. There's also no talk from Ambient Dynamics as to what the quality of the copper is. And in my listening, I did play with this aftermarket Litz cable for all of these, and I did feel like all of them did benefit from the Litz cable, but I think the Ambient Dynamics, and maybe to a lesser degree the i3 Pros, probably benefited the most. So it's a slight drawback having a slightly lesser cable, but of course it all comes down now to how the earphones sound when using that cable. And I should clarify, all of these comparisons are done with everything stock. So I've used the stock tips that came with each of the different earphones, and the same for the cables. So everything was stock as it comes out of the box. When auditioning and comparing the Lindales to the Cartos, one of the tracks that came on that really caught my attention was Two Princes by Spin Doctors. On this track, the Lindales came across punchy, fun, engaging, but still quite natural. And again, that's my sense of what natural is, but what that means is it's got a good balance of bass, mids, and treble that's reminiscent of what I would expect to hear if I was listening to those instruments live. I differentiate that from neutral, because in the theory, neutral should be a fairly flat response, but that doesn't necessarily mean natural. And so this is obviously an area of high subjectivity, and it's going to be different from one person to the next potentially. But I'll go on and describe more of what I'm hearing, so you're not basing everything on what I think is natural. Within this track, the drums had a nice sense of weight and punch to them, and the guitars had a really good sense of attack, but good tonal balance as well. Something that I heard while using the Lindales, which I've never actually noticed before, was when the bass guitar is playing, you can actually hear 
the high frequency sounds from the bass, which would be the bass strings hitting against the fretboard, the actual fingers plucking the bass strings, you can hear that high frequency detail in amongst the bass notes themselves. So that's really cool. In going back through, I could hear it on the other IEMs as well, but I wanted to share that here as an example of how clear and resolving I found the Lindales to be. The Cardos and the i3 Pro also are very resolving, so it's not like that's a separation point, but it's more pointing out that all of these are playing at that higher level. They're excellent, excellent IEMs. Much like the Cartos, I found that the Lindales were separating sounds beautifully and providing a great sense of image. But on this particular track, the soundstage isn't particularly large, no matter what you listen to it on. And so the Lindales didn't give me a huge sense of soundstage because the track itself was a limiting factor. What was important though, was that within that relatively small soundstage, I was definitely getting to hear where each of the individual instruments was placed and everything had a decent amount of space around it, as much as could be carved out from that small recording soundstage. And so at this point, I knew this was gonna be challenging. In fact, I knew it was going to be challenging the first time I listened to all three of these, but particularly with the Carto and the Lindale, each of these, when I first listened, had me wondering which I actually was going to think was the best. Moving from the Lindales back to the Cartos, still listening to Two Princes, the Cartos separated the sound a little bit better still than what the Lindales did. So individual sound separation was a bit stronger from the Carto. I mentioned before the ability to hear the texture and the higher frequency sounds of the bass guitar, so the plucking of the strings, that sort of noise, the Cartos actually brought that forward even more than the Lindales did. So their ability to provide insight into the details and the resolution of the music is excellent and slightly stronger than Lindales is. That's not so much about driver technicalities, I think, so much as the general tuning. By having a little bit more bass, the Lindales do mask a little bit of upper end detail, and that's a trade-off you're always going to have to make if you want more bass. And speaking of bass, that's where the table shifted back a bit into the Lindales' favour. Now the Carto was coming across just a little bit lightweight with the drums. They didn't have quite the impact or punch that I think they should have, and certainly that the Lindales were providing. And the Lindales are not a bass heavy earphone. They're about on the mark for me for just where it should be in terms of bass impact, but they're pretty close, I think, to what is actually natural bass. When it came to vocal quality, I actually had to flip back and forth between these two quite a bit because what I was finding was that from track to track, depending on the vocalist, depending on the recording, each of these at times would outperform the other slightly on vocal clarity, smoothness, general presentation, and so I'm going to call it an absolute draw in terms of vocal quality from these two. Something I did notice as I bounced between a bunch of tracks was that the Cartos can sometimes come across just a little tiny bit fatiguing. Not that they're harsh in the treble or peaky or anything like that, but because they are more focused on the mids and treble and the bass is fairly flat rather than having a slight lift, what that can do is just leave them feeling a little bit dry at times. And so where I wanted to turn them up more to feel the music a bit, that would then push them into fatiguing territory. Whereas the Lindales having just that little bit more bass, they were able to bring the punch and the engagement and the soul to the music without me having to turn them up quite as much and therefore keeping things better under control. And so in trying to choose between the two, you've probably already gathered from my descriptions, this one is incredibly close. If I personally had to pick one, which I do, because this is about I Am Hero, if I had to choose one of them, it would actually be the Lindale. And that's pretty cool to see a brand new product come into the market and compete with a product as strong as the Carto. And so as I said, this would be my choice for I Am Hero out of these three. But I also want to say that there'll be those of you out there that are going to absolutely love the Carto. For me, the only separation came down to the fact that I feel like the Lindales do a better job of producing a more natural sound across a wider range of genres and recordings because they've got that little bit of extra bass. It's very tasteful bass. It's not extreme. It's not boosted or bass heavy but it's got just enough to give a bit of dynamics to the sound, which is where for me, the Carto is just a little bit lacking. But if you're someone who favors detail and resolution, then I think the Carto will probably be your preference. Of course, you can always EQ a bit of bass in, but I haven't considered that here. I'm talking about these running on a straight output, no tweaking of the music. I personally lean just a little bit towards the Lindales. And so before I wrap this up and crown the Lindales as the I Am Hero in that $200 range, 
I needed to put them up against my recent reviewed Eco OH10. I said in that review that I thought they were the best IEM I'd heard for under $200, and so it made sense for me to compare them with these. Both the Lindale and the OH10 happen to be a dynamic and balanced armature hybrid, and the OH10s are listed at $199 US dollars, which is where these often sell. But having said that, the OH10 I do often see selling around the $179 mark. So they do actually come in cheaper than all three of these if you pick them up at that reduced price. And so I compared the Lindale and the OH10 on a few tracks, and I took notes on one in particular. And this time it was Standing Knee Deep in a River by Joe Cocker. Now I should mention, if you want a full review of the OH10, do make sure you check it out. I'll put a card at the end of this video where you can watch that review. But for now, let's talk about the comparison of the OH10 and the Lindale on Standing Knee Deep in a River. The first thing that stood out to me with the OH10s was just how great their imaging is. They do a wonderful job at focusing things like vocals right in front of you with a beautiful clean sense of space around the vocals. Their imaging is wonderful, as are the Lindales and everything else in this mix, but I do love the OH10s for the way they do it. The sound from the OH10s is smooth and rich and full, but they also have that treble extension to keep things generally in balance. Although I did find that the cymbals were just a little tiny bit off due to the extra treble energy. A little bit like what I described with the i3 Pro, the same issue does plague the OH10s just a little bit. When the backing vocals kicked in in this track, the OH10s did an amazing job at keeping the vocal, the main vocal from Joe Cocker right here and bringing the backing vocals just back away from him bit so there was this wonderful sense of space and depth in the soundstage. As I jumped over to the Lindale to listen to the same thing, what I noticed was that there was a greater sense of clarity coming from the Lindales, but they didn't do quite as good a job at separating the sounds out. So again, it was one of those trade-offs. I could choose to have a bit more clarity or that extra sense of depth and separation within the soundstage. The tuning required to provide that extra sense of clarity from the Lindales does make the vocals just a little bit drier, and that's not necessarily good or bad. So it, it is drier, but dry is not a bad thing, particularly if you have a very rich and warm and lush and creamy sound. Sometimes you want a bit more dryness. You want to bring forward some of that texture and clarity, but you do need to keep it in balance. And I think the Lindales do that really well. So for me, the OH10s sit kind of right on the mark of rich and creamy, but done just right. These sit just on the other side, but also done really well. To me, going back and forward between the two, the thing that really stood out to me about the Lindales was that they come across with almost a studio monitor type sound. Now, I'm not saying that they're on par with a high quality studio monitor, but I felt like they were giving me the level of insight from bass all the way through to treble that a decent pair of studio monitors does. So in that regard, if you're someone that's looking for something that's very accurate and revealing, but also accurate in the bass if you're doing any sort of editing and mastering, I think the Lindales could be a really interesting choice for professionals using IEMs here and there in their mixing. Now, I'm not suggesting you should mix an entire album or track or video or whatever using the Lindales or any IEM for that matter, but as a tool in a part of your process, I do think they could be excellent. Whereas I feel like the Kato maybe strays a bit too far away from the bass to give you the proper picture, and if you were mixing with them, you'd probably end up with something that sounded boomy on a normal system. The Lindales, though, I think could be a really interesting tool. But anyway, that's a side note. Let's come back and crown our IEM hero. It's down to the Lindale or the OH10. The OH10 has the thicker, creamier sound with a better sense of separation and space in the soundstage and a slightly at times over hot treble that can just throw tonality off a little bit. The Lindales are more neutral. They can be a bit dry in the vocals, but that comes with extra clarity as well. And so in the end, where I had to make my call, because once again, much like the Carto Lindale comparison, the Lindale OH10 comparison, I was almost flipping a coin. And so what I ended up deciding on was the fact that the Lindales just ever so slightly overdo the upper mids and treble, and that can make them just a little bit harsh at times. It's going to vary from track to track, but I did find on tracks even like Standing Knee Deep in a River that the Lindales just go a bit too far. They're just a tiny bit too forceful at the upper frequencies. And so for me, the OH10 does retain the crown of I Am Hero around $200. US but on this occasion, I honestly don't think you can make a wrong choice. The Carto and the Lindale in particular are both wonderful IEMs. I think if you're looking for the most natural sounding IEM of this lot, it's probably the Lindales, because they do get that 
just appropriately slightly lifted amount of bass to balance off the rest of the frequency response. And so these are the ones I'd reach for if I wanted a more reference style approach. If you want to go even further into insight, detail, clarity, maybe neutrality rather than naturality, then the Cartos are also absolutely amazing. The i3s, as you can probably gather, probably sit the next tier down for me. They're beautiful, they're really interesting, they're super comfortable, but they do have that overdone treble all the way through to the upper end of the register, and that for me just leaves them a touch behind. If treble's your thing, and you want something that comes pretty close to dead flat from bass all the way through to treble that also has excellent separation and imaging, then the i3 Pro is still excellent. There is not a single IEM here that I would recommend against buying. If I had to recommend IEMs in this set, I'd comfortably recommend the Carto and the Lindale, and of course the OH-10, but for different purposes and for different tastes. So I hope that's proved useful for you. If it has, I'd love it if you'd hit subscribe and like. It really helps the channel out. Also, don't forget about the possibility of becoming a Patreon. We've got some exciting new things happening over there, including a new tier that allows people to join product tours. So you can get your hands on a lot of this gear that I review. So check out the links. Everything's down below in the description. And speaking of links in the description, if you want to buy any of these IEMs, I'll put links down below where you can click through and say thank you to the people that provided them. And finally, make sure you've entered the Viram 1 giveaway with the question that I posted earlier in this video and be subscribed and stay tuned for my announcement of that one in a couple of weeks. For now though I'll leave it to the music so happy listening and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound. <laughs>